الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد الصادق الأمين المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا اللهم انفعنا بما علمتنا وعلمنا ما ينفعنا وزدنا علما وفقينا إذا علمتنا We move to that chapter speaking about the birth of the Messenger of Allah with take with his bread. Hadith number 47, speaking about eating chicken. This was eaten by the Prophet in some occasion. Uh, not that frequent, you know. But the Prophet gave a hint that the birds uh, the bird's uh, meat is going to be the most uh, uh, meat con consumed in some a a times, you know, some ages, you know. And this is apparently our time, you know. Nowadays, we see how the consumption, you know, of the chicken in our days, and this is maybe considered as one type of the uh, meat bird. The other one speak about pumpkin, you know, and the folks of God used to like pumpkin. And uh, Saint Anas bin Malik moderated it. He said that from that time on, he, he became uh, 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 interested in eating pumpkin all the time. I received a question, you know, I, I remember in the past about the sunnah addressing or whatever, you know. From this hadith, we may get that even for the life matter, which is not related to religion, you know, in the tradition of the Prophet ﷺ, we consider it part of the tradition of the Prophet ﷺ. Why? Because what Sayyidina Anas al Malik did say in this hadith about pumpkin, when he observed that the Prophet ﷺ uh, would like to eat them, you know, and he became uh, fan about them or whatever uh, in this regard. And this is maybe applicable, applicable to all life matter. Uh, what I highlighted also as a reminder that we are not going to consider this tradition equal to the tradition related to uh, religious matters, you know, or worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is a tradition, but it's not equal to, the, to those traditions, you know. Why? Because the major task of the Prophet was uh, to teach uh, people their religion, you know. And uh, this is uh, part of the Hadha Jibreel Atakum Yalimukum Dinukum. This is Jibreel came to teach you your religion. So that's why you don't put, uh, put them in the same. Uh, rank, even though uh, the person who uh, practices this is the same one practice the other one, you know, and he's the most beloved person to us, you know. So, but yet, since we have this difference, you know, between religious matters and other matters, you know, that's why we don't put them in the same matter. Uh, I remind myself and everyone about uh, Sayyidina Abu Umar, how he used to uh, keep up, you know, even. Uh, in traveling from Mecca to Medina or Medina to Mecca to just stop at the same stop of the Prophet laugh at the area that the Prophet used to laugh at, you know, pray in the same area. And he used to have certain signs, you know, he's going to water the tree all the time just to keep it up, you know, to know about these signs, you know, or put a rock here or a stone or whatever, you know, at this regard, you know. And this is, uh, that's why in Bukhari it's mentioned by uh, Abdullah bin Umar, not by anyone uh, other Sahabi, because he was the most famous in this practice, you know, how he tried to uh, describe the way the Prophet ﷺ did take from uh, Medina to Mecca, you know, and highlighting the old names, you know, on his way, you know. This was narrated by Abdullah bin Umar, no, no surprise about it, and when we know about it, we know that anyway we try to mimic the Prophet by, by it, you know, this is going to be a great position for us, you know, because this is part of action of the Prophet, part of his tradition. When we have the sincere intention about it, you know, we are going to be rewarded, you know. And this is 
perhaps the most great important thing is going to connect us more and have more relation with the Prophet The other hadith speaking about uh, the area of the sheep that was most favored to the Prophet which is the arm, the arm. Uh, and this hadith that uh, one of the I think he is of Mawali of the Prophet even though it's not specified here, Abu Ubaid. Here he said Abu Ubaidah. Again, in my memory, it's Abu Ubaid. Okay, I may check it you know, for you, uh, inshallah. We'll give you the answer tomorrow if it's possible or today. In, the, in my memory, it's Abu Ubaid, not Abu Ubaidah. Here it's mentioned Abu Ubaidah. Abu Ubaidah is a very famous companion, you know. He is one of the ten uh, companions who were given the good news by the Prophet وسلم, that they are people of heaven, okay. Whereas Abu Ubaid, uh, I myself, I don't know a lot about him. I know him from this hadith that when he served the Prophet وسلم, with a sheep, and the Prophet وسلم, asked him for an arm and was given, another arm was given, and asked for the third arm, and uh, Abu Ubaid said, oh, Rasulullah, how many arms do you have in the, in the sheep? You know? And in the sa same exact matter happened with Sayyidina Usama Ibn Zayd. And you have another narration, I don't know if it's mentioned here, uh, uh, with Usama Ibn Zayd. And exactly the same happened with uh, Abu Rafi'. Abu Rafi', another person who used to be slain and was freed by the Prophet Sallallahu Same as Abu Ubaid, to best of my memory or knowledge. Okay, so this happened three times, you know, in the time of the by the Prophet Sallallahu it took place three times uh, with three different companions. One is Abu Ubaid, one is Abu Rafi, and one is Usama Ibn Zayd. Okay, and this firstly tells us that the Prophet Sallallahu was to give preference uh, the tradition of the Prophet Sallallahu not to condemn, not to put down, not to speak badly about anything. Okay, but he for sure used to give preference to certain areas, certain persons, persons, certain people, and you name it, okay? So here, he gave the preference to the art, okay? And this is the opinion of majority of scholars. Some, they said, and perhaps say Aisha among them, that uh, the preference of arm was because the need of the arm is the first one to get well cooked, you know, and ready to be eaten, you know, in ammonia. And she gave a reasonable, uh, uh, no, okay. Thank you. Here, uh, Sayyidi Nuruddin has another copy, and there it's, it's mentioned Abu Ubaid. Okay, so now I'm more sure, please correct it, okay? Take away the, uh, the ta or in the uh, translation, take away the uh, H, okay? Take them away. Shukran okay. So again, Abu Ubaid, Abu Rafi, and Usama bin Zayd. These are the three persons who have had this event. So what I said, the first thing that tell us that the Prophet used to show favor to the, this portion of the sheep, uh, be, bearing in mind, yani, this was, one, one of the most important and uh, perhaps the only one. And in the time of the Prophet, they don't have all those types you know, of food that we have nowadays, okay? So this is one of the, what you may, may, may call luxurious you know, position, you know? And uh, this is perhaps the only one they have, okay? And here the Prophet Sallallahu gave preference to the Arab, which means something here. So the second point, which I'm trying to say here, it's not well known to everyone, even to the children, that the sheep only have two arms, okay? The Prophet asked for the third one, okay? And he was faced by this answer, and in some narration, is it mentioned here? In some narration that he, yes, it's mentioned here, that if you did not ask, you are going to give me arm as long as I ask for arms. Without any 
What benefit I get from this? When we deal with the prophetic matter, <coughs> and prophetic statement, okay. I don't make it come to me. Okay, what do I mean to come to me? Yani I'm here, I have certain look, I have a certain thought, I have uh, certain practice, I have certain politics, okay? I'm going to subject all the tradition of the Prophet <coughs> to my station. I'm not going to move. Okay. This person, I don't say he will not benefit from the tradition, but his benefit is going to be very minute one, okay? The one who is ready to benefit from it should do the opposite. Okay. Rather than moving everything and changing everything you know, in the tradition of the Prophet ﷺ, in his mind, not to uh, the actual change, he should change himself. Okay. <coughs> now, I, when I re read, read this hadith, I'll be honest with you, I, I have a read, a read it a lot, you know, but I should find my way here again. I should go back and ask myself, how did I do this? How did I do that? Okay? Even though I read it many times, you know, this time should be another way, you know, in, of improving myself. Okay? I cannot say that I have completely moved, you know, toward the tradition of the Prophet. I still have a lot of deficiency. That's why, regardless of how familiar I am with this hadith, you know, I should go back every time, I should quit some of my stationaries, you know, and move toward the hadith. The famous example we have about this, now I, re I remember all the, the verse of the Quran, I'm going to mention it after this example, you know. The famous example we have with Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, <laughs> and this was beyond the uh, thoughts of everyone, you know, when the Prophet Sallallahu told them that he moved from Mecca to Jerusalem within one night and returned back. Even we read in Syria, Alhamdulillah, we don't know the names, you know, but we read in Syria that some of the Muslims, they converted, you know, when they, they hear this one. And yeah, this was beyond their ability to, uh, to understand, to accept, to believe in. Okay? Whereas in Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, by one narration, he was called Siddiq from that night and on, okay? He said, for sure I'm going to believe him. I believe him with, uh, for more far distance, you know. If he told me that he came from the heaven, you know, I'm going to believe in him. And subhanAllah, not by chance, you know, but the Prophet in the same particular night, he moved to the heaven and returned back. And he gave this assumption before knowing that the Prophet you see how great is this? I, I look at it, this is part of what Sayyidina Abu Bakr narrated. Sayyidina Abu Bakr climbed the perfect one day, one year after the death of the Prophet And he said, I have, uh, perhaps not one, one year after the death, you know, less, because he said, I have heard the Prophet one year ago on this pulpit saying, no one is given anything better than Yaqeen. And this is, for sure, we explain yaqeen. This is the Arabic word yaqeen. We explain it as belief, as iman, as pillar of iman, that we should thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of us, we have it, you know. But here, as you may see from the behavior of Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and the others who converted, and the third who just said, we believe in this, you know, whereas Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq has the ability to inspect that the Prophet ﷺ has a journey to the heaven, you know. We, by this, for sure we are going to see different standards, you know, of yaqeen, okay? And that, for me, should be something to stimulate me, to upgrade, to increase my yaqeen. Okay. The, the ayah, the verse that I uh, remember that فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِي مَا شَجَرَ بِيْنَهُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُوا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَبَلْتُ يُسْلِمُ تَسْلِيمُ 
all levels of the Prophet ﷺ. Many of those sections in the Pakistan, namely the Brilwi section, when you enter their mosque, in many mosques they write this verse, you know, وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ اِظْظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ جَاءُوكَ فَاسْتَغْفَرُ اللَّهُ مُسْتَغْفَرُ لَهُمْ وَزُولَ وَجِدُ اللَّهُ تَوَّرَ الرَّحِمُ And whenever they treat themselves unjustly, you know, and they came to the Prophet seeking istighfar, Allah, and the Prophet make this istighfar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to forgive them. This is very nice, very great, we should be proud of it, okay? But what I look, would like for perfection of ourselves, to combine it with the coming verse after it, because in the Quran you have this verse that I recited right after it, okay? Uh, 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 don't misunderstand me. Be too happy about that particular face, uh, uh, verse. Uh, put your head up. Be proud of it. But what I expect from many events, the Prophet wants you to be much more perfect. How? By handling the second verse there. Okay? Because here in the Quran, they were joined together. The first verse tells us about the favor of the Prophet ﷺ on us because such a sinful person is in real need of istighfar of the Prophet ﷺ all the time. Okay? And this is very honorable, very, very happy uh, matter for me, happy information, happy verse. I'm going to be, uh, yeah, we have uh, some verses in the Quran, we call it Raja. And some verses we call it to, to get scared, you know, and we, 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 we should have both of them, you know, in a balanced way. And that's why Sayyidina Allah bin Mas'ud, one of the most educated person in the Quran, he said, we, uh, we have five verses in, in Surah Al Nisa. I don't like to read one of them, you know, even if I'm given the most luxurious matter in this dunya, Hamr al Na'am, their time, okay? And he mentioned all of these five verses regard, regarding repentance and istighfar. And he included in them this particular verse. So he, for no doubt, it's out of discussion to be happy and to be well familiar with this verse. Put it in your mind all the time. But I would like to join the other. What the other one? Allah's word by the Lord of the Prophet that they are not going to be believers till they <coughs> seek your judgment whenever they have any dispute. And they are going to accept it without any negative feeling inside their heart and with full submission. Why did I bring this verse? Because here, as the Prophet said, I don't have the authority to say, but the Prophet said that if those people, they gave full submission to the Prophet they are going to hand him many arms from one, one sheep. Right? That's what we want. And this, this is, did not happen once, and this comment from the Prophet did not come once. It came three times. And it came in what matter? Not in a matter, experimental matter, or scientific matter, or uh, uh, something that needs to be thought about, you know. It came about very simple and trivial matter. This is like one by, uh, one, by one is equal to one, or one uh, when you add to one is equal to two. It's same, okay? Everyone knows that the sheep only have two, two arms, you know. Yet the Prophet ﷺ, here I see it. Why the Prophet is going to say, if this is a, why? This is the not happen. And the Prophet ﷺ did not get another arm. Why? This, this is just a lesson from the Prophet ﷺ to teach everyone how he should respond when he has, for sure, any verse, any instruction, the Holy Quran, or any instruction by the Prophet And I may understand this verse, which is too important to me. Yani we have these few verses at the beginning of Surah Hujurat speaking about respecting the Prophet Okay? 
is to respect him, not to have your voice louder than his voice, not to shout behind the rooms of the Prophet ﷺ, or you name it, okay? So the first verse of him, what did it say? Shukr. Say, لا تقدموا بين يدي الله ورسوله. Okay? Don't give an idea. Don't analyze. Don't show your opinion. Okay? In front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger. This is, to the best of my knowledge, that doesn't mean that physical being in front of Allah, inshallah, will be in front of Allah and be in front of the uh, uh, Prophet, inshallah. And inshallah, this is going to be the happiest day to us, inshallah. Okay, we hope this in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But are we going to delay our safety at that moment? No. We start now, okay? As Muslim, when I hear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking about something, when I hear any hadith from the Prophet it's above my experiments, above my knowledge, above, above even the most trivial and simple fact that everyone agree on it, okay? And the, the answer of Surahim. And the Prophet in history, he used not to speak a lot. Few words, as Sayyid Aisha said, few words. And he used to repeat them by everyone, okay? Just to make them understood by anyone. So here, to say, if you are giving me this, I, I, this is not wastage of time. This is not to give an assumption of something not happening. You know? This is a lesson for all of us as instructed in that particular verse that I spoke about, to give full submission. And this, as I said yesterday, match with what I said yesterday. What is your name? Who are you? You are Muslim. What's the meaning of Muslim? Islam, what is it? Submission. Okay? The, the, uh, we, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent many messengers, gave different names to different nations, you know, and your, uh, your special name that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminded you about and made, uh, perhaps made you <coughs> proud of it. Okay, according to some interpretation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called you Muslimin. Okay, and this is uh, for sure to be proud of this name, but to be also matching this description. This name has description. Do you match this description? I'm Muslim. Okay, you are Muslim. Let's see you at this particular verse, you know, about when the Prophet ﷺ speak about something. Sorry to keep talking you know, about this point because we have a lot of problems here. I'm not going to go to the problems, you know, but all, uh, let every one of us, you know, try to remember <coughs> the problem that we have nowadays in this regard and how the, some verses of the Quran, some a hadith of the Prophet and they are treated by certain people, how they are analyzed, how we practice them, how we accept them, how we feel. I'm going to be too honest with you, okay? Personally, myself. I'm not going, I don't find myself, or I did not find myself, have the same equal feeling for all of the ayat or all of the hadith. What do I mean by this? I, some of them, I feel they are too reasonable and well understood to me. The other, um, maybe a little bit far of my nature or my understanding or whatever. The problem here is not in the verse or the hadith. The problem in my nature, in my response, in my understanding. If the companion, when they gave bay'ah to the Prophet ﷺ, he put this in this way, fil usri wal yusr wal manshat wal makrah. The usr, when you have hard time, yusr, when you have easy time. Wal manshat, when you are happy with this, and the makrah, when you hate it, okay? The Prophet ﷺ gave you an order or command, and you hate his order, you obey, okay? That's what enabled me to speak, you know. 
This is a significant deficiency in myself when I find myself, you know, for certain verses or for certain hadith of the Prophet I don't find myself, taste them, understand them, apply them in the same way that I respond to the other hadith and the ayat. All of them, they are the same. No difference. Where is the difference? This is my deficiencies, okay? I should count, collect my deficiencies, and try to uh, change myself, adjust myself, okay? I'll tell that in this particular uh, command or this particular verse, I'm good, okay? And the other one, I'm not that good, okay? And this leads me, يعني, sorry to come from one uh, subject to another, you know, which we should <coughs> consider it in our life. We tend when we admire a person they act to accept everything of him. Okay? And when we otherwise have bad uh, idea about a person to put down everything in him, okay? And we are wrong in both aspects. And this is going to be harmful to us, okay? Because uh, uh, when you <coughs> look at as a person, for sure you should respect all Muslims, you know, especially those when you find out some novel, some great matters, you know, and then, you know, for sure you should respect them. But you should put in your mind that they are human, okay? And they may have some deficiency. So, why? Why I should do so? Because I'm sorry to tell you, this happened all over the ages, you know. But in our time, it sounds like happening more, okay? We'll have certain people, you know, who are decent, and they are pious, and they are really nice people, you know. All of a sudden, they will change to very high figure, you know, and start to have those fly ideas, you know. Some of them may say, I am the Mahdi. This is written in the book, you know. I'm not speaking from يعني, uh, myself, you know. This is yeah, because I faced this problem with a person, and, uh, uh, and really I read it in a book, you know, after it. After that, okay, which gave me significant relief, you know, because really I trust that person, okay. But he has something, you know, which make it, you know, unclear to him. And as you may know, you know, when, whenever you go to those sophisticated uh, ranges, you know, you are going to have much more of those interference. Okay. Why this is important for us, you know? Because this is, is going to be a shock for some of us. And this shock, for especially those people who are a little bit shaky, or they came to Islam recently, or he spent significant li uh, amount of his life out of uh, uh, religious matters, you know, and now try to go back to Islam, this may kick him out completely, okay? And that's what I don't want. And, and, and one, if I want to put it in one word, okay, I tell you, don't have anyone between you and Allah, subhanahu wa okay? But we are, few days before the hereafter, okay? This person is more religious than me, is more sincere than me, uh, more worshiper of Allah than me, more knowledgeable than me, and you name it. All the series, you know, from the beginning to the, to the end, but I put in my mind, there's a possibility, Allah subhanahu wa is the absolute, there is a possibility that one day I may find this person, you know, completely out of it. And this is, shouldn't change my relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what I mean by it. You got my point? This is very important point, okay? This is the first point. The second point, sorry to speak a little bit about those matters, you know. The second point, unfortunately, even in Arabic, we don't have except one name. We say Sheikh to everyone, okay? The one who read the prayer is Sheikh. The one who teach Quran is Sheikh. The one who knowledge, knowledgeable in fuqah is Sheikh. The one who did, you know, all of them will have same name. And this is may create some confusion to some of us. Why? 
Because you may ask the very knowledgeable in Quran about fuqh, and he is ignorant in fuqh, he doesn't know anything. Perhaps you know much better than him, you know, fuqh. But this is sheikh, you are not sheikh. Okay. Again, we should have some recognition here, okay? Religion per se, no one has the right to interfere with anyone. Everyone has his own, okay, his own specialty with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this was the Sufi they call a sir. A sir is like hotline between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one has any interference. But on the other hand, since Islam contains a lot of knowledge, a lot of sciences, a lot of experiences, and you name it, there is what we call it, and you are all familiar with it for the modern sciences nowadays, specialty. You recognize specialties, you know, in the modern sciences a lot, you know. And since Islam as a science and as a, an experiment has a lot of branches, be oriented that, not necessarily if you have this person, you know, uh, good or uh, perfect in this, this field to be as such as the other. Okay, these are the two points that I want to highlight, you know. Uh, uh, here, only you give full submission to the Prophet Sallallahu Okay, this is the only way, this is the only channel that we have. The rest, they are all, all in the top of my head, okay, but with, with giving this possibility all the time. Okay, put it, putting it in my mind. And for sure, is, this is going to be severe in, on many of us and is going to create confusion for many of us. What we should do? We should check, we should consult with our knowledgeable people, with our knowledgeable teacher, with those who know that all of their time, they have been straight. We, we trust their sincerity, okay? And here, I don't expect everyone, you know, to have a solution of this tragic problem, you know, by himself. He may have it, you know, but in many uh, uh, other occasions, he may need to consult, he may need to seek help, you know, of the others, you know, to get over this problem. We'll move, inshallah. Shall we answer the question? Let's finish the, the chapter. We have two hadiths in the chapter. Yes, the, the hadith number 50. This is Umhani. This is daughter of Abu Talib. Okay, the Prophet Sallallahu was raised up in the house of Abu Talib, and this is his cousin. Okay. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he entered the house of Um Hane, he said, anything available? And she said, except uh, uh, dried uh, bread, you know, and vinegar. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said uh, that the house which contains this is not going to be considered as poor house, okay? And this is, as I said before, you know, tell us how was the style of the life of the Prophet Sallallahu you see, because I have no doubt, and perhaps myself, you know, sometimes, we get surprised about this comment, you know, and uh, especially when we apply it to our practice, we never practice this, you know, but you see this look, when, when you have this look from the most beloved person, you know, that the Prophet Sallallahu <coughs> means something, you know, for and what it means that we are, alhamdulillah, in very high standard, you know, of ni'am of Allah, favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? And we should always remind ourselves. And even if we want to put this in the lifestyle, and uh, for sure, this is, tells us, and this is even, has been proved, you know, even if it's not proved, but it has been proved, you know, medically and uh, physiologically, you know, that this is perhaps enough for you, you know, so to, to survive, you know. And when we waste our time, you know, in uh, seeking 
more fine food and more food, you know. For sure we are going to eat much more, you know, whenever we have different types of food, you know. But we should expect that we are going to have more diseases, we are going to have hypertension, we are going to have diabetes, we are going to have heart attack and you name it, okay. Especially that we don't move a lot, you know, nowadays, you know. All those factors are going to work. So here, uh, really, uh, these comments from the Prophet for we take it for sure, as we said before, and uh, we should have this consideration. And at least, this is the least thing, you know, whenever you feel yourself not lucky in this life, go back and spe uh, read the lifestyle of the Prophet Or if I want to put, put it in another way, the one who is the most uh, lucky and the luckiest among our, our, us, the one who look in the matter of religion and akhirah to, to those who are above him to improve himself and he look to the, uh, to the matters of dunya to those who below him just to accept and be pleased with Allah and we are in real need of both things why? The first one, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, This is the area of competition, okay? And you are not going to compete when you look at those people who uh, have less in practice than yourself. If you keep up with all prayer, pray, player, uh, prayers, and uh, you have your brother or neighbor, just pray Asr sometimes or pray Jum'ah sometimes, you don't look at him, you know, as a good simple or good for comparison, you know, because this is going to make you go down. You look at the ones who keep up with nafila, keep up with other matters, make the hajjud or whatever, just to try to compete with us. And I remind myself and you about Sayyidina Abu Muslim al-Khawlani, how he, uh, when he missed the meeting with the Prophet Sallallahu how he tried to compete with the companion, and this is derived from the verse of And the second point, again it's needed. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in Quran, Radiyallahu anhum wa radu Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with them and they are pleased with Allah. Who are these? The companion. Okay. وَالتَّابِعُونَ بِإِحْسَانِ Those who came late. Like ourselves, okay? How I'm going to know if uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased me, with me or not? How? Is it important point to know? For sure, for me, it's more, more, much more than important point, okay? How I'm going to know? I asked a sheikh one day, he said, you look at yourself, see, are you pleased with Allah? If you are pleased with Allah, that means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with you. If you are angry with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you are not pleased with your provision, with your position, with your situation or whatever, that means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not pleased with you, okay? So I need, I must look at those people below me to make myself pleased with Allah. Why? Because by this way, I know for sure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with me. We are in real need of both of them, to look up to those who are better than us in the ma religious matters, you know, and to look down uh, <coughs> on uh, those matters of life. Then this hadith about three, they are companions, they used to be too young, you know, in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the three companions, and they are from the family of the Prophet Sallallahu one, one is his grandson, Sayyidina Al-Hassan ibn Ali. He was uh, seven years old when the Prophet Sallallahu passed away. And the other one is Ibn Abbas, who was 13 years old when the Prophet Sallallahu passed away. And Ibn Ja'far, I'm not quite sure how old was he, you know, but roughly perhaps similar to Sayyidina Ibn Abbas. He was one of the very young of the companion, you know. And uh, the three of them, they were of the family of the Prophet Sallallahu The first one is his grandson. The second one is his cousin, you know, through his uncle. And the third one is the son of his cousin. Okay. And uh, what else about them? 
you have Sayyidina Al-Hasan and Sayyidina Abdullah bin Ja'far, both of them, they look like the Prophet They have resemblance in their face, in uh, the shape of the Prophet Sayyidina Al-Hasan and Sayyidina Abdullah bin Ja'far. So, these three, they ask this woman, Selma. Selma is Selma, slave woman, freed by the Prophet ﷺ. Wife of Abu Rafi. We spoke about Abu Rafi. This is his wife. And also she used to be slave of the Prophet ﷺ. And I'll tell you, yeah, those who did not hear it from me before, all slaves came to the hand of the Prophet ﷺ, they were freed. And when the Prophet ﷺ passed away, he did not have any slave in his uh, position, okay? But who, uh, one of those who came to his position was uh, Sayyidina Abu Rafi and his wife Selma. They were sp uh, speaking about her here, you know. Uh, they, uh, uh, the relatives of the Prophet said they asked Selma to cook food, so, uh, one of the food that the Prophet said used to like it or give it a preference, you know. And they said, uh, she said, you see this answer to say, to tell us about the significant changes within few uh, short period of time. You are not going to like it today. And this tells, uh, tells us about the opening, you know, in the life and how the life changed significantly, you know, after a few years, you know, uh, from the time of the Prophet until the time of Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab or Uthman ibn Affan. And for sure, when we look at ourselves nowadays, we have much more huge, you know, difference, you know, in the luxurious matter that we handle our matter about it, you know, naming, uh, uh, feeding, uh, clothing, and you name it, you know, all, all those matters. You know. So they insisted on her to do it, and she took barley, not we, bar barley, and then cooked it with some oil and make some pepper and other type of like what uh, uh, you use it a lot you know, nowadays and the, she said this is one of the uh, type of food that the prophet used to love, like he loved you know and uh, eat from it okay. what does this mean for us you know? uh, if those high figures, you know, the family of the Prophet Sallallahu they did not like it, you know, after a few years, what about us? And again, this is a reminder, this is a reminder of us about the standard of the lifestyle of the Prophet I would like to add number 50 and 51 to page 14, you know, where we have the lifestyle of the Prophet Because I felt Yani we are too poor there, you know, we, are, we only have one hadith in that chapter, you know, and I would like to see all those reminders to, to me and to you, you know, about the lifestyle of the Prophet so We'll answer some question. that Sayyidina Amr Khattab will not allow people to eat meat two days in a row. Is this true? If so, what? This is not true. Yani he did not set a rule that the one who is going to eat meat in two consecutive days is going to be imprisoned, you know, or going to be beaten up or this or that. No. Sayyidina Amr Khattab was for sure, he was the governor, and he, one of his significant description, he was one of the most warrior about Muslim all the time, concerned about Muslim all the time. When he found that woman, you know, try to stop nursing or stop breastfeeding her, her child, you know, just uh, her baby, just to get salary from Umar al Khattab. In the narration, they said he, he was crying in Fajr prayer, you know, and they were not able even to understand his recitation. Okay. This tells you uh, uh, the, the way, how merciful, how use, he used to be concerned about Muslim. 
And for sure, such a personality, such a person who is concerned a lot about Muslim, uh, for sure is going to be concerned about this life and the hereafter. Okay. So personally, for sure, he <coughs> doesn't eat meat every day. Yeah, to make a, short, a long story short, I, I did not come through this narration. You may, may be more familiar. Just remind me if you have this narration. But what the narration come to my mind, that he was in the market, Sayyidina Amr al-Khattab, and he came through a famous companion carrying meat. And he asked him, what is this? He said, uh, my family, they would like to eat meat, and bought, I bought it to them from the market. And he said, whenever you you know, have any desire right away, you go and buy it, you know. And he said, where do you go about this verse, you know? And he gave him this verse. أَذْهَبْتُمْ طَيِّبَاتِكُمْ فِي حَيَاتِكُمُ الدُّنْيَا And he have used all of those luxurious matters, you use it in this life. Even though this verse was revealed regarding non-believer, not believer, okay? So the, uh, Sayyidina Umar used it for the believer just to try to see all those descriptions that are not liked by Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemns them in the Quran, even though it's used for the non-Muslim, to try to avoid But for sure in that narration, they did not say that Sayyidina Umar took away the meat or prohibited him of taking the meat or asked him to, to go back. You know. He just gave a word, you know, gave an advice. You know. Always, whenever you have, you feel desire to eat something, you go and buy it from the market. What's about this verse? Yeah, this is the way, say now. So I imagine, I may be wrong, you know, that uh, as uh, happened frequently, and I have heard that, you know, you, you have the narration, you know, heard by someone, the way he understand, uh, understood it is going to convey it in a different way. Then it reached what is, is the question that, the Umar al-Khattab prohibit anyone of eating meat in two consecutive days, okay? So this is the narration that I know, that I'm familiar with. Was the Prophet ﷺ semi-vegetarian? No, the Prophet ﷺ was not uh, vegetarian or anything of that uh, pattern, you know. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ, whenever he has food, uh, has meat, Available, he used to eat. One time he entered his house and uh, he saw uh, the container boiling, you know, with some meat. And they said for him oil and uh, bread and something of that regard. And he said, what's about the meat? They said, this, that meat is uh, given to uh, uh, Barira, Barira, a slave woman of Sayyidah Aisha as a charity and you don't eat charity. He said, yes, it's charity for her, but it's a gift from her to us, you know. And he asked to bring the meat to him. So this point tells us that, no, he was not a vegetarian. He was not semi-vegetarian, okay? If you want to help yourself, you know, by certain matter of health, uh, and you were uh, instructed to be vegetarian, don't relate it to the Prophet Just keep it for yourself. For Sahaba who used to, re to resemble him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, yes, you are right. Uh, the four Sahaba, they were Sayyidina Al-Hasan and Sayyidina Ja'far, the father of Abdullah ibn Ja'far, who was mentioned here, and Sayyidina Qusam ibn Al-Abbas, and Sayyidina Abu Sufyan ibn Al-Haris, the cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Not the famous Abu Sufyan that you are familiar with, the leader of the armies of the Mushrik all the time. No, this is another Abu Sufyan. His name is Abu Sufyan Al-Haris. These are the four most uh, famous companions that they, they look like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Again, Sayyidina Al-Hasan ibn Ali, Sayyidina Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, Sayyidina Qusan ibn Al-Abbas, and Sayyidina Abu Sufyan Al-Haris. After the death of Sayyidina Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, the Prophet ﷺ told his son Abdullah ibn Ja'far, Ashbahta khalqi wa khulqi. The same statement he gave to the father, he gave it to the son after the death of the father. He told Abdullah ibn Ja'far, you are similar or look like me in your shape and in your characters. Yes. This is the 
That's why I said so. So Sayyidina Abu Abu is not included among, uh, included among these four, okay? Those are the most four famous person, you know, but you may add to them Sayyidina Abu Abu Jafar and many others. Uh, Ibn Hajar and Fatih al-Bari, I think he made them 18 or so, but I may disagree with some of them, you know, because he took uh, that will be narrated that this one looked like that person. And that person looked like the Prophet Does this necessitate that the, the, to have that one look like the Prophet? No. Because the one who looked like the Prophet, for sure he has something similar and something different. And the other one who looked like th that particular person, he may be like him, you know, in the matter that is different than the Prophet matter, okay? And th that's why I disagree with this, yani, to just pile numbers, you know, and mention names, you know. For sure, they are much more than five. Uh, they are more than five. They may reach ten, you know, but not the way was done by Hafiz ibn Hajar. Ibn Hajar, I think, they, he reached with them, you know, eighteen or more. Yes. Um, would you say the Prophet Muhammad like pizza? So most of these things would um, amount to pizza. What is that cheese? <coughs> no, let's leave this alone, you know, because, no, you cannot call it pizza, no. If you want, you know, to be happy, uh, some of you people, you know, and even in Syria we have it, you know, uh, in the morning, we have what we call halal, or, or this that is done, you know. This is similar to something was eaten by the Prophet Wasallam. They used to call it khabis in the time of the Prophet. I don't know if you are, uh, when we went to Brother Nasir, you know, he has it, you know. This is, I think the Pakistani, they do it. And even in Syria, we have many of us who do it, you know, we make it, you know. And we call it halawa in Syria. This is the one, and when we put some flour with the, uh, sugar or whatever, and uh, fatty matter or greasy matter, you know, together, you know, okay? Even though in the Prophet ﷺ time, they used to put honey rather than sugar, okay? So, if you want, make this, you know, and invite us. <laughs> flour, flour, honey, and uh, greasy, fatty, what, what they call it, you know? Okay. This is called khabis, okay? So I know that many Pakistani, they do it in the morning, okay? And in some of my invitations, you know, we had this is you know, safe for us. So this is similar to what the Prophet Sula. If you are interested in this, this. But pizza, no. Apparently here, Paris in U.S. is going to be much worse. She said, or he said, I don't know who is this. You know that slave, what we know about slave, that they are going to be chained, tied up, beaten up. So is it better to call them servants? If this is the case, and this is what we understand, yes, perhaps we are right, you know. It's better to call them servants, you know. Uh, I know this, yani. Uh, it's not something new for me, you know. But sometimes, as you may see me, you know, I may get, you know, enthusiastic, you know, in this, this talk. And I feel when I say slave for myself, you know, it's much more to put myself down, you know, when we speak about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Servant doesn't, for me, give this meaning of putting myself down. For those who have in their mind what's mentioned here, I apologize, you are completely right, you know. This is not meant by any way. Uh, I would like to be slave of the Prophet at that time, you know, even if he tied me and beaten me up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, even though he did not do so. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam described, and I'm sorry, I shouldn't mention it, this perhaps, but this is that just as 
hope, you know, or not reality. Because the Prophet ﷺ was described by Sayyidina Aisha that he never beaten up anyone with his hand except when he make fighting uh, in the sake of Allah. What can somebody do to overcome their dislike for vinegar or honey, which the Prophet ﷺ recommended? Again, I'm going to say, firstly, this is not as important as the other tradition that we spoke about, worshiping Allah, related to religion. Yet, these are, these are tradition of the Prophet ﷺ. For sure, first thing, we shouldn't speak badly at all about those men, okay? This is one of the respect, you know. You don't speak badly about honey, about vinegar, about pumpkin, and the, uh, other matters that <coughs> you came across that the Prophet ﷺ used to them. them. Then, after that, it's not a matter of forcefully to apply it, okay? But I see, this is not for everyone, but myself, I would like to have this, okay? I see that if you try by training, by habit, by you, you name it, you know, to make them more like to the, you, it's a good idea. But I'm not going to tell anyone, haram, you should do this. You see the difference, okay? This is not haram and halal. This is just a matter of preference. I, I, this reminds me of a matter you know, about myself. I don't know, should I mention it or not? I am left-handed, okay? And uh, when I heard that the Prophet ﷺ prohibited us of eating in left hand, you know, I trained myself, and now I got used to it. Even though up till now I feel if I eat, eat by the left hand, you know, I'm going to be more skillful, you see? But I never try it. Why? Because, yeah, you see, you are going to find yourself in many matters of your life. You have been instructed to do something opposite to what is easy for you, what is your nature or whatever. Some of them, like this one, left hand and right hand to eat, you know, this is haram, okay? The other, like what addressing the question, they are not haram, okay? If you try to avoid those matters, you know, nothing wrong there, okay? Uh, but it's haram to speak badly about them because they, they have been praised by the Prophet So this is the first point. And the second point, I feel that it's better, you know, if you try to train yourself, okay? Because I think all of those matters, you know, and including this, you know, it's a matter of getting closer to the Prophet And uh, thank you for this question because this reminds me about that hadith of Salma. Why did Sayyidina al-Hasan, Sayyidina Ibn Abbas, and Sayyidina Ibn Jafar, these are too close to the Prophet yet they ask to eat a food similar to one done to the Prophet They are too close, much closer than me, you know, to the Prophet Why did they ask this? I think my answer is, to get closer to the Prophet Try to resemble the Prophet And if they, those close relatives and high figures and companions, they did so, what should I do? What is the favorite? food of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As he mentioned this, the arm of the sheep, okay? What type of vegetable? What is cooked, you know? I think the most uh, famous one is the pumpkin, okay? There's another hadith, but it's not mentioned that this is the favorite, but the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ate it. I don't know what's in English, it's silk. We call it in Arabic silk. And this is similar, not exactly similar to the uh, leaves of the grape. Back in Syria, we cook the leaves of the grape. We put rice, you know, and cook them. We have similar to them green leaves, you know, but they are not of grape. We call it silk. 
I don't know what, what's it in English. Yes. And even in, in some narration that in Selma, uh, that uh, she included this, you know. This is ser uh, vegetable. It's not mentioned that this is one the most preferred one to the Prophet Sallallahu But we know that the Prophet Sallallahu ate them, okay? From uh, uh, fruits, you have uh, uh, melon, okay? Some they said watermelon, but that's, uh, most they said no, this is melon, not watermelon. And you have not cucumbers, something similar to it, which is to, uh, it's thinner, you know, and longer, and try to, not to be straight, you know. We call it in Arabic, qissa. and it's mentioned in the hadith, okay? It's not cucumbers, something uh, similar to it, okay? And be beside dates, you know, and uh, rutab. And what type of drink? The most preferred one to the Prophet of drink, the sweet and cold one. Cold and sweet. Do the grape leaves have a rice inside it? So. And what? Grape leaves, then filled with rice. Yes, La rice, rice and meat. Rice and we meat. have it with rice and meat, you know, and we cook it. You know, this we call it yabrak in Arabic. Or in our uh, accent, you know. But you have similar to them done, you know, of green leaves, we call it silver, you know, it's not grape leaves, you know. And in the same pattern, we have rice and meat inside it. Make it like this, you know, and we cook it, you know. We call it silver. What's the best book, Sira, to know more about Sayyidi Khadija, radiallahu ta'ala? I'm sorry, in English I don't know any, but there's a famous woman writer in Arabic, and really she's admired by, she's Egyptian, she was Egyptian, and she is admired by many persons, you know. She had a book about the wives of the Prophet and she has a book about the daughters of the Prophet So those of you who know Arabic, you know, they may go by this. Otherwise, I don't know about translation, you know, but perhaps Brother Nuruddin may translate something, you know, or uh, form something, you know, for it. باب ما جاء في صفة this the, the other chapter will move to another chapter باب ما جاء في صفة وضوء رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم عند الطعام وضوء you know it at time of eating here وضوء many scholars they said that it's not meant the wudu that we learned from Sayyidi Nuruddin that these are the pillar of the wudu, these are, no, they, they meant by it the washing hands, okay? This was one of the traditions of the Prophet ﷺ, washing hands before and after eating. Here Sayyidina Salman, we spoke about Sayyidina Salman before. This person is knowledgeable in Torah, Old Testament, not knowledgeable in the Gospel. Why? Because he was Christian before becoming Muslim. Okay? And any Christian, you should be familiar with the Old Testament and the uh, Gospel. Okay? So here, Sayyidina Salman, he said he read in Old Testament or Torah. Some they give difference between Old Testament and Torah. They consider them as two books, not one book. Okay, so Torah is the book of Sayyidina Musa. He read there that the blessed food or the blessing of the food when you make wudu after it. Again, the meaning of wudu here to wash hands, not to have complete wudu that we have been instructed to do for prayer. 
And uh, he mentioned this to, to the Prophet And the Prophet said that the barakah or the blessing to make it before and after. To make it before and after. So what we get from this, for sure, Torah or Old Testament, it contains a lot of information. Yet, Sayyidina the Salman Pharisee will not take this, you know, by his own, you know. This is one of the greatness, you know, about the companion. Anything they come through, they'll check it with the Prophet So what I like and look forward for myself, whenever I come through any event in my life, to try to match it with the seerah of the Prophet and I think, yet perhaps I, I don't have it in practice, you know, but I think all of us without exception, whatever happened to them in their life, they are going to have something similar in the time of the Prophet So this, I call it really a reference, okay? And uh, from where we, we got, got it? From Sayyidina Salman. Sayyidina Salman, very knowledgeable person, and have they spoke from Allah, even though we have some changes, you know, in it or whatever, you know. Yet, whenever they have anything, it's going to go back to the Prophet. And uh, when we inspect the seerah of the companion in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu we are going to find them. Whatever happened to them, even a very trivial matter, they will go right away and check with the Prophet Sallallahu or consult the Prophet Sallallahu or mention it in front of the Prophet Sallallahu that's why when some person said in front of Sayyidina Abu Khattab, we have done this during the time of the Prophet he said, Sayyidina Abu did you inform the Prophet about it? You see, and this tells us about the importance of it. Sayyidina Abu said, did you inform the Prophet about it? So now, how we, we practice it? Go back. Okay, go back. If you find some verses in the Quran, very great. No verses? Seerah of the Prophet. Be specialized in Seerah, okay? To have a good look, you know, and know how to go back, you know. And then try to, inshallah, we have this opening, you know, of Targhib and Targhib just to encourage everyone to collect the maximum, you know, of the tradition of the Prophet. And by this, for sure, all of us we are going to be more in, uh, able, you know, to refer to back to the Prophet ﷺ, to go back to the Prophet ﷺ. And I think anyone of us who has this unique reference, you know, all the time, even though he may be mistaken sometimes, or wrongdoer, or sometimes intentionally do it, but when he, he has this habit all the time, my soul that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive him. So, uh, and, uh, did he get some, so something extra from the Prophet ﷺ? Yes. And he has certain knowledge. The Prophet ﷺ gave him extra. He said, before and after. And this is as a symbol, you know, as you are going to feel it and understand it in any action you have ever. Okay? And that's why the nation of the Prophet ﷺ, they were called the best among nations. Why? because they are inheritors of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What does it mean? As Fakhr al-Razi said in his tafsir, when Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala mentioned this, this group of the Prophets, you know, this the largest group in Qur'an, 18-1, 18, one, one eight. 18 one was, were, were mentioned in one page of Qur'an, and at the end of this page, that uh, you should follow their guidance. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala addressed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you should follow their guidance. So Fakhr Razi said, this interpreter of Quran, he said, this shows you how great is the Prophet When he was instructed to collect in himself, you know, all those traditions, all those guidance of different prophets, you know, uh, uh, it tells you how, how great is the Prophet And this, if I want to go a little bit further, our Islam is a collective, okay, and our Quran is a collective. That's why in one hadith the Prophet said that I was given the uh, first seven longest surahs, you know, as a substitute of a Torah. 
and uh, my own dose of hundreds, you know, as a substitute of the Anjil. And Al Masani, another name, as a substitute of the uh, Sal. And, and uh, the Mufassal is was special for this nation. What this tell me? That anything came by any prophet or as a revelation form before the Prophet ﷺ has been included in the Quran and you have something extra in the Quran. Okay? So regardless of how you know, how do you feel, whenever you have this reference that I spoke about, you are going to get more. Okay? Uh, physically and spiritually. Physically and spiritually. And this is too important. And you see, you see I feel how appreciative is going to be Salman al Farisi when he was told by the Prophet about this. And this reminds me of the opposite. This is Salman al Farisi, the top, and the other person, Suwayd ibn al Samit, he's from Medina. Before Islam in Medina, he came to Mecca early. And at that time, the Prophet will not hear about any high figure or noble person come to Mecca without exposure to him. And he came to Suwaid ibn Samit and told him about the revelation and he recited some of the Quran. And what was the answer or response of uh, Suwaid ibn Samit? He said, perhaps you have the same thing that I have. The Prophet said, what do you have? He said, I have Majalla to Luqman, which is collection of the all wisdom of Luqman. <coughs> The Prophet ﷺ, he's fair. He's not unjust with anyone. He said, what you have is good one, but what I have is revelation from him. Apparently, that person did not listen. And he returned back and was killed by his people. You know. See, so compare Salman al-Farsi with Suwaid ibn al-Sami. Okay? Salman al-Farsi, highly respected by different sections of Muslim, you know. Uh, Sayyidina Ali ibn Abtal described him as got the first uh, knowledge and the last knowledge, meaning the Torah and the Quran, okay? This was the description of Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib to him, you know. He is highly respected. Suwaid ibn Samit, I assume many of you, they never heard of him, you know, okay? Why? Because he felt himself equal to the Prophet uh, the, I have the same thing that you have, okay? So here, for me, I don't know if you want to go by this way. I, sh I would like to put myself down whenever I want to recite Quran or uh, read the tradition of the Prophet I would like to put myself down, put, put my knowledge away and put everything, you know, to, to get the maximum of those matters, okay? Because if I say, uh, I'm going to recite, I know Fatiha. No, I don't know Fatiha, okay? Now, when I want to recite Fatiha, I'm going to take away everything and make myself prepared to hear again from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? This is the way you should recite the Quran. And this is the way to get benefit of Quran. But to say, no, no, I know Fatiha. Uh, I'm sorry to tell you, yani, uh, I have been asked, even though I shouldn't be asked, you know, they thought that I'm Sheikh, you know, and they, uh, many, they ask me to give them some word, okay? And I'm telling you, I respond, pretend I, as a sheikh, <laughs> okay? And tell them, I want to recite, to recite Quran. And I'm sorry to tell you, some of them, they respond very well to this. The Allah, Quran, Go, go away. Go away. <laughs> Quran, yeah. Quran, you don't, you don't, you don't like the Quran as a word, okay? So, so here, yeah, what I'm trying to say, what we are familiar with, what we used to it, this is for sure. This is nirmat from Allah, okay? That's why those who are newcomer to Islam, they admire Quran a lot. We, as people you know, of Islam, we don't admire Quran a lot. Why? Because we are familiar with it, we are get used to it, and this is problem in us, okay? I should, whenever I recite Quran, to try to feel it as something new coming to me, okay? Even though 
since I was, I don't know, five years old, or I keep hearing, you know, this surah of that surah, you know, this doesn't mean that there is no coming with this. And that's what they said, you know. Whenever you have Quran, you have no coming, okay? لا يخلق على كسرة الرد. This is the description of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's not going to be used, you know, or abused, or regardless of how many times you repeated it. You are going to find it new all the time, okay? Do I have the same feeling? To be honest with you, no. I don't feel I may feel it sometimes, but I'm not that fortunate to feel it all the time, okay? Yani, according to the description of the Prophet ﷺ, whenever I recite Qur'an, I should feel something new coming. Whenever I look at the tradition of the Prophet Sallallahu it's the same pattern. Why? Because he was described kind of Quran. His character was Quran. How do you increase your love to al -Bayt? Okay. For me, the best way to increase your love to the Prophet Sallallahu Okay, because anything related to the Prophet ﷺ is going to be loved for you. And uh, sometimes I, even though I may declare that I love the Prophet ﷺ, I find myself way when I saw those people, you know, around me, someone when they, they have the hair of the Prophet or this, or the sandal of the Prophet, or how they take care of it, you know, I feel myself down. So this is... For sure, al bayt come at the top, you know, but anything related to the Prophet ﷺ, the city of the Prophet, the, anything belong to the Prophet ﷺ, companion of the Prophet, and you name it, you know, all of those matters related to the Prophet ﷺ, all of them, without exception, we love them out of our love to the Prophet. Did the Prophet Sallallahu use a walk stick? Yes. Yes. He used to have a stick called a shawha. I don't know if it's mentioned here. Yeah, yeah, he used to call those tools, you know, a certain name. He has a stick called a shawha. And uh, he may have other sticks, you know, perhaps more than one. And this is, again, as I said about turban, I spoke about turban that this is Arab habit, you know. Again, the stick to be used especially for giving talk, you know, like khutbah, this is again an Arab habit, okay? Yeah, this is, I think it was before the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ approved it, okay? And he, to have a stick, especially when you give a talk, you know, standing, this is an Arab habit, was before the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ did it. Before, the other question? Yes? If, um, I read a narration that said if a Salman al Farsi died when he was 250 years old. Is this true? For sure, if you tell me that this is true, like authentic hadith, not. Okay? Yani we have different opinions. Some they said 350. The least that I came across, they said 200. Yes. This you may believe it. Why? Because. When you look at the story of Salman Farsi, that he served the first, first uh, he f first he defected from his family, you know, and then he sa first uh, served the first person till his death, the second and the third one, fourth one, fifth, six, six, okay, and then he was captured and taken to Wadi Qura and stayed there for a while, and then he was taken to Medina Munawwara. And after a while, the Prophet Sallallahu came. If you count those years, you know, you feel, and it's accurate, not yani, beyond that. And uh, as we know, it's possible. Perhaps in our time, we did not find, you know, uh, I remember a few years ago, uh, in National Geographic, they said that this is the oldest person in the world, you know, once 165 years was, you know, in Caucasian or, uh, area of water that you know. This is was 30 years ago. I don't know if he's still alive or not, you know. But this is the highest number I hear nowadays, okay? So if this is the highest number, 165, it's not yani, impossible to have a person like Salman Farsi 
uh, lived for 250 years, you know, in the old days, you know. And when you look at his story, th this make it uh, as high possible. Yes? It wasn't normal at that time to live for this woman, or anywhere near there. <coughs> According to the Prophet they used to live much more. Yeah. Sayyidina Adam lived 1,000 years, as in authentic hadith. Sayyidina Nuh is longer than this. Okay, so, and the Prophet described that this was their ages, you know, and then started shorten gradually till his nation, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, and in his nation, roughly they are between 60 and 70. Okay. And another hadith in Muwatta al-Imam Malik, that the Prophet ﷺ, when you look at the previous nations, you know, and to what, uh, how long was their ages, you know, and he felt that his nation, their ages, they are too short, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted him his Laylat al-Qadr as a compensation. Okay. This is in Muwatta al-Imam Malik. Okay. That this is as a compensation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Laylatul Qadr khayru min alfi shahar. Yeah, when you spend one night, is equal to more than 80 years. 80, eight, zero. Okay. Yeah, and this as a compensation because the first Prophet sallallahu felt that the, the ages of his nation is short. Yes. With the ages, there are also the size of the Yes. Again, this is in Bukhari that the size was much higher. So the taller you are, the closer you are to the Prophet No. no. Closer to Sayyidina Adam, not to Sayyidina Adam. <laughs> <laughs> okay, stop here, inshallah, 15 minutes.